The following VETSIM video has been created by Aviation Pro for the B1 pilot rating course of the VETSIM Pilot Training Academy. Visit academy.vetsim.net for more information. In this video we're going to take a look at the basics of IFR and VFR navigation. So it's essential to know the basics of IFR and or VFR flying before you fly on the VETSIM network because it simply makes your flight smoother and you don't run into trouble when air traffic control gives you certain instructions or you have to fly a standard instrument departure or things like that. Now since most people who join VETSIM for the first time fly IFR, we're going to take a look at some of the basics of IFR flying first. Now flying an airliner on the VETSIM network is probably the form of transportation that is most seen on the VETSIM network, so we're first going to start with the flight management system. We've discussed this before in the video about how to get started on the VETSIM network and that is wise to have a, one of those payware products with a flight management system. Because the flight management system allows you to navigate through the virtual skies much easier. Now of course it depends on the aircraft type, how the flight management system works. Uh, and the flight management computer that you can see here might be different depending on the aircraft type too. So you have to do some studying in order to really get to know how that thing works. So make sure you study well in order to get uh, comfortable with using the FMC. Of course it's very easy this way to navigate because you can enter a standard instrument departure then you enter the route into the FMC and also the standard terminal arrival route and so that completes your whole flight basically and it allows you to make a smooth flight all the way from A to B. When you have fully programmed your FMC you can use one of the modes on the mode control panel of the airliner in order to follow the lateral route and also the vertical route using either for example in this Boeing 737 LNAV or VNAV or one of the other modes that are available. Now inside the flight management system there's a huge database with all the waypoints and the standard instrument departures and standard terminal arrival routes and this is called the AIRAC data. Now the data changes over time, every month there's a new set of AIRAC data that you can download on the web and install to your add-on aircraft in order to have all the latest waypoints and procedures and by updating this data you're always sure that you have the latest waypoints and procedures for your airport you're going to fly from or to. Now make sure you have at least a good updated version of ARAC. Uh, usually when you buy a new product you will get one of the latest ARAC datas. And of course you don't need to update it every time. Usually the changes are very small. But if there's a huge change in one of the airports you regularly fly from or to, it's wise to update the ARAC data. And this makes sure that everything is up to date. So now that we took a quick look at the FMS and the FMC of airliners, Let's go back to the very basics of IFR flying and that is VOR navigation. Now VOR stands for VHF Omnidirectional Range and it's basically a station on the ground that allows aircraft to fly to or from and also measure the distance from that station. Now you might have seen one of those stations if you drive on a highway or near airports for example. And in the old days when there was no GPS yet, pilots used those stations in order to navigate through the skies. Now even though we have fancy GPS systems nowadays, VOR stations are still being used in order to fly to them and also in general aviation airplanes without GPS systems in order to fly IFR. Now one of the most common ways th of the VOR station being used is to fly to that station uh, when air traffic control is vectoring for you for example. So we're just going to take a quick look at how to fly to a VOR station. So welcome into the Speechcraft Baron, we are uh, flying now along the coast of Australia and we're going to tune in uh, the frequency of this VOR station that you can see on this chart and we're going to take a look at how to navigate to this VOR station very quickly. So we're just going to tune it into one of the navigation radios right here. Frequency is 140.6 and as you can see on the navigation display this needle starts to move and this is the needle basically that shows you how to get to this VOR station. So what you have to do is turn that needle and wait until the, the this indicator moves, the lateral indicator. So as you can see it now starts to move and this is basically a radial that we can intercept in order to fly to this VOR station. So as you can see we have to fly to the west, uh, roundabout to the west in order to intercept this radial. So we're going to do that now. as you can see as we make the turn uh, the needle starts to move further because
because of course we're flying uh, uh, not all the way to the to the west yet so we're gonna have to uh, make a little bit more of a correction to the right in order to fly direct to this VOR station so just a bit more and then as we intercept this radial this 270 degree radial to uh, this VOR station we are flying direct to the VOR station now of course when you're flying an airliner you can basically do the same uh, you have to tune the frequency in one of the navigation radios and then also using the navigation display uh, you can change the course right here and then the needle will move at some point so there we go, the needle was moving, so we just have to turn left a little and we intercept this 27 two degree radial towards the VOR station. Now, of course, an even more simple way is to go to the FMC and enter the VOR station's name in the leg page and then you can use LNAV in order to fly direct to the VOR station. But this is the more uh, common way to do it via the radios and of course you will also use this when you're flying an old general aviation airplane without f without one of the fancy GPS systems. Now another basic thing of IFR flying is flying an ILS approach. ILS stands for instrument landing system and it allows pilots to land at a runway in low visibility conditions. Now the instrument landing system basically consists of two different things. And the first one is the localizer, it's located at the very end of the runway and it sends out signals to the aircraft and its instruments in order to provide lateral navigation. So this helps you to get aligned with the center line without seeing the runway. Now the other part is the glide slope antenna. The glide slope antenna also sends out signals to the aircraft but then orientated vertically. And this is of course for the vertical navigation for the aircraft. And this allows the pilot to make a smooth glide all the way from a certain altitude all the way down to the touchdown zone. Now just like flying direct to a VOR station, flying an ILS approach is one of the very basics of IFR flying. So we're just going to take a quick look at how to do this. So we are now in a Boeing 737 cockpit in an airliner. And for an ILS approach you basically have to do uh, the same things as for a VOR, direct, flying direct to a VOR. You have to tune in the frequency of the ILS, which is stated on the charts. And you also have to set the inbound course uh, to the runway, uh, which in this case, runway 16 is 161 degrees. So we're going to take a look at the navigation display now and we're going to see what happens. Again, uh, we have the lateral information, that's the um, information that shows us the deviation from the course to the runway. But in this case, we also have a glide slope indicator. And the glide slope indicator shows you how high you are uh, and how much you're deviating from the glide slope. So in this case it's coming up already so we're gonna have to start to descend already a little bit in order to get down before we capture the glide slope. And now the localizer is being captured as well. So instead of only having a lateral navigation as seen in the uh, video segment about flying direct to a VOR station. We now also have a glide slope indication right here and we have to um, fly direct to the runway uh, on the runway course heading of 161 degrees and we're going to follow the glide slope as well. Now uh, how hard you descend depends on the aircraft type. Uh, for airliners it's mostly around 700 feet per minute uh, but the glide slope in most airports is configured in such a way that you have to follow a three degree glide slope. At some airports this degree is higher, uh, for example at London, London City it's uh, known for its high glide slope and uh, the higher rate of descent, but at most airports it's three degrees. So these are the basics of ILS approach and this will get you down on the runway safely in foggy conditions as you can see here. So now that we've gone through the basics of IFR flying, let's take a quick look at VFR flying. VFR flying is actually very simple, you just need landmarks in order to navigate through the airspace. Now using a photoreal scenery in flight simulator is ideal because it allows you to navigate much easier and you will be able to recognize buildings and highways a lot easier than with the default scenery of flight simulator. Now as said in the video about how to read and use charts, 
for VFR flying there are also some standard routes, especially routes that go into an airport and that are going out from an airport. And you have to follow those routes just using the landmarks and usually this is a highway or a row of buildings or electrical mass, things like that. Uh, one other thing to keep in mind with VFR flying is that you can fly into certain airspaces that are restricted for VFR flights. So this is a list of all the classes of airspace and as you can see uh, in class A it's not allowed to fly VFR so this is an airspace where you cannot fly VFR only IFR or special VFR. So there are some airspaces that are restricted for VFR flights and also uh, the airspaces are different. Uh, some airspaces you uh, are controlled by air traffic controller uh, but in other airspaces you have to make sure you are uh, keeping distance from other aircraft yourself so you have to uh, review those airspaces thoroughly. Other airspaces that are restricted for VFR flights are of course uh, the higher airspaces and also military airspaces. Now there's one more thing we have to discuss before we end this video and that is the equipment codes. We have this scene coming by in the flight plan video on how to file a flight plan on the VETSIM network. And the equipment codes basically are codes that show the air traffic controller what your aircraft is capable of. Now it's wise to enter one of those codes in your flight plan because using those codes air traffic control can determine how well you will be able to fly a certain route or uh, if you have TCAS or not, uh, things like that. So here's a list of all those codes and you have to add them in the flight plan uh, behind your aircraft type and this allows the air traffic control to see what your aircraft is capable of. So these were some of the basics of IFR and VFR flying and you now also uh, know what the equipment codes are and why you have to add them to your aircraft type in your flight plan. Uh, we hope this video helps out. Uh, in the next video we're going to take a quick look at the rules and regulations on the VETSIM network. Of course there are some strict rules and regulations and we're going to show you where to find them and we're going to take a look at some of the most important ones for you as a pilot. So thanks for watching this video and good luck with flying on VETSIM.